This is the Open University. I've been asked to talk about Scott Walker, who died, alas, uh, last week. And um, <laughs> talking about Scott Walker is actually something I've fled from. I've been asked many times by, uh, God bless him, Rob Young from The Wire, who is writing uh, or compiling a big book about Scott Walker, to contribute essays and things, scholarly Festschrifte, as they're called in German, um, the celebratory uh, essays about Scott Walker. And I've always felt ambivalent. I don't know whether that's a reason not to have... Because I almost turned these requests down. I didn't feel I had anything usefully positive to say about Scott. And um, But I would say that I, I think he was tremendously important and a tremendously inspiring and, and important artist. And, um, you know, in the top 5% of people that you should pay attention to and um, learn from. Uh, 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 just someone who made amazing records. I th I'm particularly impressed by Bish Bosch, The Drift, you know, his late work. Um, <laughs> nevertheless, I think it's more a question of admiring his nerve, admiring his poundian need to make it new, to keep uh, expanding the grammar and the vocabulary of um, rock music, a form which I think is now dying. Um, but let me let me rewind a little bit um, and talk about my relationship with uh, with Scott, such as it was, because I didn't really rush out and buy his records when they came out. I, I did make sure to get copies of them one way or another. Uh, I inherited uh, the Scott one to four when my flatmate, my New Zealand flatmate Vicky, left, went back to New Zealand, and she had all the the vinyl of early Scott Walker. I was also friends in the 80s with a guy called Nick Halliwell, who's now um, making records. Very belatedly began to um, record as The Granite Shore, uh, and I'd recommend you search out his, his music if you like sort of early Scott Walker. You can hear that in Nick's work. Um, Nick was, um, he was one of the pale young men, I used to call them in the 80s. I was going to do a compilation, maybe for Creation, maybe for L, which was going to be... Uh, these pale young men who made um, bedsit kind of demos, and Nick Halliwell was one of them. He had a fantastic song called The Face of Fortune. In the face of fortune, ride on the... And it was very um, Scott Walker-esque, you know, and um, heroic. And I, I suppose in a way Scott is... There's a generational gap, obviously, between me and Scott Walker. He's what he was, um, what, 72, I think, when he... Was he? No, he was older, 76, I think, maybe. Um, so there is a 1950s kind of Roy Orbison quality to his early songs, which alienates me slightly. There's this heroic, um, the, the voice with a capital V, you know, this thing of, um, he really had a voice. And of course, I'm going to have to compare him later to David Sylvian, um, who also really had a voice, but, but was also, I think, a little bit overly concerned with being an artist in a slightly precious way. I'm even tempted to use the word pretentious, which is really unusual for me because I never accuse people of pretension. I always think that's a great virtue and that it's, it's great to be pretentious. To some extent, I think that about Scott Walker too, but there is something about Walker and Sylvian that reminds me of Susan Sontag, that there, um, there are people who are Anglo-Saxons who wish they were French, <laughs> like me. I'm often accused of the same thing. Uh, and to feel that um, their medium should be made serious with references to serious literature. So you get David Sylvian rehashing, you know, referencing Sartre as the age of reason or whatever. Existentialism was also very important for both of them. Well, for all three of them, if we're talking about Sontag, Walker and Sylvian. And um, somehow there's, it, it's a, there's something a little bit coffee table about their idea of what art is. The art is what has already been established as art. Um, I think Scott, you have to exempt Scott from that because he's he really does, later on in his career, he breaks through to something. This need to make art with a capital A, the serious 
heavy art that's difficult listening, you know, um, did push him through to something which was astonishing and unique. And I was very, I'm very proud that he ended up on the 4AD label, which was where I started, you know, that there was this, although I've also accused the 4AD label of being coffee table in some way, because there is this slightly precious arty uh, feeling to it. And just as a contrast, what, what do I mean? What would be art that's not arty and precious? Well, it would be something like Bertolt Brecht, people who are inspired by François Villon, you know, the medieval poet. There should be something a, a bit bawdy and Rabelaisian and concise also um, and coherent about good art. I think folk forms have really influenced me and, and there's something direct and quite rough textured about folk forms. Of course, there is also this rough bawdy quality in Walker's late lyrics, you know, there were fantastic, on Bish Bosch, fantastically vulgar passages and Joycean um, passages and Rabelaisian passages. So he, he also understood the need for that, something David Sylvian I don't think ever has. Uh, too fragile to fuck was <laughs> the epithet I think Paul Morley had for David Sylvian. Um, and, and if you read actually the, the paragraphs that David Sylvian released on Scott Walker's death, there's something very amniotically bland about the way he describes Scott's search for his own artistic voice and all the rest of it. It's just these rather measured phrases which describe someone, describe himself, essentially. I mean, this is the thing. If we talk about an artist like Scott Walker, we're essentially talking about ourselves. So uh, I do want the caveat to be in this, that I'm criticizing myself a lot when I'm, when I'm criticizing Scott. So um, there is this swagger and this kind of rawhide um, champion the wonder horse quality. I think I actually dissed Scott Walker in a, in a 1980s NME article I wrote about Jacques Brel, where I described him as having a typically Canadian um, nostalgia for all things European. I don't think I even knew that he was a Californian. I thought he was actually a Canadian, um, which was, just shows my ignorance. But um, it is that Sontag thing of being, being a North American and, and, and wishing to be immersed in European culture because it seems so more, much more serious and dense and uh, high level than American culture is. So I, 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 I guess I was also a, a competitor in the Brel translation game. Obviously, I came along in 1986 with a Brel EP, which was my own translations of Jacques Brel songs. Um, I did um, uh, Jackie, I did um, Ne me quitte pas, and I did uh, Voir un ami pleuré from Brel's last album. I'd been turned on to Brel by David Bowie, obviously, um, and I'd seen the film in 1974 in Montreal, part of the American Theatre series, um, which m me and my mother used to see in Dorval, out near the Mirabel Airport, um, which was um, uh, the, the, the film of the stage show, Jacques Brel is Alive and Well and Living in Paris. Mort Schumann put it together and uh, translated most of the songs, and I thought he translated them very badly, because precisely what was lacking was the acerbic precision of Brel's original French songs. Uh, Brel was a kind of um, a moralist. Um, he was also someone kind of misanthropic in a way, a, a, against a lot of characters that he would produce in his songs on stage, especially you see him becoming the gay uh, suitor in Les Bonbons, for instance, or the... Um, uh, next, apparently, is the song that David Bowie really um, was hooked by, this song about, you know, being checked for syphilis when you're joining the army. Au suivant, next. Um, the thing that Mort Schumann introduces, unfortunately, is a kind of glitzy, gaudy um, kind of incoherence. Um, and, and unfortunately, that's something that David Bowie then draws uh, uh, He thinks he's drawing it from Brel. He's actually drawing it much more from the bad translations Mort Schumann, and of course there were things like Seasons in the Sun, Terry Jacks had done, uh, got to number one with a Brel song. All these Anglo-Saxon covers of Brel tended to play up the a kind of, you know, half-baked idea of French poetry and um, a kind of impressionistic, uh, uh, sometimes influenced by hair. The Jacques Brel is alive and well living in Paris is very much influenced by the rock opera hair. So a kind of company rock opera-esque um, kind of... <laughs> Um, American take on uh, Brel. And Brel actually is, the whole point of Brel really is that he's, his songs are very targeted. Les Bourgeois, for instance, about how the, the young uh, kids are mocking the old uh, lawyers as they walk up the street to the restaurant, the fancy restaurant. And then over time they become those lawyers themselves and they get their, the, the noses thumbed at them. So um, 
there, there is a kind of Moliere quality, you know, or, or, or you know, I, I relate it much more to medieval, medieval, you know, in the sense of Villon and poets like that, roughness and bawdiness, but also a kind of um, Voltaire, um, Moliere, this kind of, um, the use of stereotypes and the use of morality, tight little morality uh, plots. Uh, and I think this is what Bowie abandons. Or or, Brel, or 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 Scott Walker for that matter. I, I wasn't really aware of you know. Apparently, Julian Cope um, was was promoting um, Brel uh, Walker's versions of Brel songs, and then Mark Armand jumped on the bandwagon, and they were all doing it um, with these the, the existing translations. So I came along without having sought permission from the Brel estate or anything like that. I just came along like a pirate and did my own versions, which I, I was working on. Uh, I, I had a job when I first moved to London in J.D. Potter on the Minories, which was a nautical bookstore. Since I looked like a pirate and I was acting like a pirate, you know, pirating these Brel songs, it's all quite appropriate. It was a, a bookstore that sold nautical charts to old mariners <laughs> and upstairs had some books as well. And uh, so in my spare time, because not many customers came in there, there weren't enough old, salty old sea dogs, and it's since closed. Um, but uh, I would sit there translating these Braille songs, really very loose and free translations, but I was trying to restore the, um, the directness and the kind of the folk song-like quality where it comes... Folk songs often have a very tight shape uh, of, you know... Like Les Bourgeois, whatever, you know, it's a, 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 in verse one, we're thumbing our noses at someone, and verse, by verse four, we're going to be those people, and people are going to be thumbing it. You know, there's a certain symmetry and a certain moral coherence about them. And um, they use stereotypes, they use um, maybe the Commedia dell'arte stereotypes a lot, for instance. And uh, I wanted to restore a bit of that, uh, and something Brechtian as well, because I'm a big fan of Brecht. Uh, Brecht you know, was obviously immersed in this whole um, business of um, using stereotypes creatively, uh, using folk literature, using uh, the murder ballads or the um, moridette, as they're called, the old um, barrel organists with their ballads, which had been refined over the, you know, honed over the centuries to have maximum impact and were a kind of combination of sensationalist, gruesome newspaper reports of murders and things and kind of morality ballads you know, telling you how to act and how to live, and and always on the side of the people, the common people. And um, so I thought there's, there'd been a kind of glitzy, kind of theatrical overlay, which had to be, you know, sandblasted off these Anglo-Saxon versions of Brel. Scott Walker, um, I, I, I do have to approach him, his influence on David Bowie, in the later David Bowie, from um, 1991 onwards, or, you know, um, Black Tie, White Noise, there's a, a very obvious um, Walker um, influence on that. Oh, he covers Night Flights by Scott Walker. Scott Walker br brought out the most extraordinary album of uh, his own songwriting, uh, quite the most lovely songs that I'd heard in years. Scott Walker, of course, he was returning the compliment of Scott Walker, having done with the electrician that sort of late 70s period, Scott Walker, done a sort of Bowie tribute of his own. So there was this two-way influence between them, which makes it more interesting. But I, I tend to, I really don't like it when Bowie tries to be Scott Walker. I think it's the anxiety of influence, the, the, the bad side of influence is that an artist you like starts imitating another artist you like, but does it kind of badly. So, you know, this heat on the 2013 Bowie album, which is um, very much... Uh, a Walker pastiche. Bowie was very good at pastiche and it was the best impact that had on me was when I didn't know what he was pastiching. I had no idea of what Elvis Presley had done so there's all, all sorts of things that, uh, that Bowie's doing which are just copies of Elvis Presley that I thought was just Bowie being Bowie you know because my ignorance was a kind of bliss. Um, but I did know about Scott Walker, and I did know that Bowie was most, mostly influenced, we mostly drawing from that kind of climate of Hunter period of Walker in the 80s, when he's kind of crossing over from a, a, a fairly coherent song structure into the, the sort of avant-garde work that he would be doing later. Of course, he's getting more and more avant-garde, a bit like David Sylvian as well, um, around about the Blemish time. Um, you really have to admire these people for going into that um, uncharted territory, but at the same time, you're not necessarily digging out the records and listening to them. 
every day or even every month or even every year. When did I last listen to Bish Bosch? When it came out, I listened to it a lot and I was impressed by the depths of the literary references and the, you know, the astrological kind of um, stuff and the ridiculous titles. I mean, I, I was really uh, bowing down in awe before the, 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 the sheer audacity of his pretension, really. Um, I, I think you have to, you just have to admire that for its own sake. But do you dig it out and listen to it very much? No, you don't, um, in my case. Uh, maybe I should. Maybe I should go back to it now. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm not... Um, what, what am I listening to now? I'm listening to a, a, a record uh, which um, my friend Tug played at a dinner party last weekend, which, <laughs> which is um, Ellen Arkbro Brass, music for brass, um, which is just beautiful. I don't know. It doesn't, it doesn't set out to try and um, map new territory but it is it's got enough tuning anomalies I'm really into tuning anomalies you know to uh, to impress me and um, I listened to my own Bambi album actually from 2013 the other day and thought that that was good because it had a consistency which is kind of unusual for my records I was trying in that record to revive my um, teenage demos the style of my demos when I was playing hammering on an angle poise lamp and hammering on cardboard boxes and playing kind of uh, modified guitars, prepared pianos and things like that. So that seemed to be a style which I could call my own. And, and um, I thought that was quite interesting, the way I'd revived that in 2013. Um, gosh, that sounds terrible if I'm saying, <laughs> saying I listen to my own records. But I do. Um, I'm not going to pretend that... Um, I hate them as Nick Cave does. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know about about Scott. I mean, I had a, a strange dream about Leonard Cohen the other day. I was asking him about his use of the um, Technics KN six hundred, and I, uh, you know, he he uh, he was answering patiently answering all my questions about why he started using this keyboard rather than his guitar, and because I also had a Technics KN eight hundred. Actually, I had a better one than Leonard. Um, and used the arrangement patterns in the uh, 90s, throughout the 90s. And uh, I, I find that kind of interesting that someone would um, choose to go more into areas of warmth, uh, as Cohen did, you know, especially in his live concerts. He, he, um, he had the girl backing singers. He had, there was a, a, a very warm, like old red wine or something that's matured. You know, he, he got more warm as he got older. Um, there's the heroin period of Leonard Cohen, which is kind of uh, frightening and, 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 and self-loathing and alienating. And then there's this later period where he gets more comfortable in his own skin. And so he's creating a warm kind of um, enveloping, hugging kind of music, which is great live uh, and, and was really uh, wonderful to experience. But um, Scott Walker kind of went the other way. He started pushing into Arctic areas of uh, alienation in which he's, he would go into the studio and just, you know, hammer on bits of meat or whatever. Um, and it's impressive, but impressive in the way that a glacier floating by is impressive, or, you know, a, a mountain range in the Arctic. Um, amazing to look at and, and slightly frightening. Uh, not warm, not embracing, not, uh, not talking about universal human experiences at all. So I have to say, is that, is that a cul-de-sac, you know, is, or is that... It's admirable, but but where does it take us, and you know where does it go? Uh, so, but of course that's a question you ask all, uh, all of all avant-garde art, really. Where what is the point of doing it? And and I think a, a couple of episodes ago I talked about the idea of there being an inherent virtue in any kind of parallel world building, any kind of suggestion of an alternative universe, an alternative way of seeing, is useful and is important. So I do think I think Scott is tremendously useful and important to artists as a signpost <laughs> or perhaps a no entry sign I've already done this I've already been here you can't do anything more erudite anything more kind of thunderously strange and alienating than say Bish Bosch um, his son O record uh, I, I also listened to and, and enjoyed um, <laughs> if you can be said to enjoy something that uh, strange and thunderously um, different um i don't know um this is this is the narcissism of minor difference this is me talking about an artist who i i do 
respect and I do approve of. I, I just, I think latterly, because uh, I was writing a little bit for The Wire occasionally, and I did feel that, that to write a fest shrift uh, about Scott would just be a little bit too much. It would be pretentious on my part because I never knowingly went out and bought uh, a record of his. Nick Halliwell um, used to propagandize on behalf of, uh, well, people like Leo Ferre, Nick introduced me to when we used to hang out in the 80s. Uh, but also Scott Walker, and I was always um, slightly resistant. I don't know. I, I thought Leo Ferre was too romantic, and uh, and yet I did go off and steal the chord sequence of um, Avec le Temps because it's a beautiful chord sequence, and uh, adapt it to um, into my song, the guitar lesson. But um, I don't know if I ever took anything from Scott Walker. I can't sing like that, obviously. Um, Scott, I, I think everybody works with the kind of limitations they have, or even the talents they have. Scott had this amazing baritone, which was like Sinatra's. You know, he could sing like Sinatra. I, and the parallel with David Sylvian is that David Sylvian also had an amazing, has an amazing voice. And um, so therefore they could warble in that voice, which had its own inherent authority, over these musical landscapes which are incredibly strange and alienating and unconventional. In a way, he, he, he had a conventional voice. There's, some, there's a jokey um, recording of a DJ um, singing uh, like a Kylie Minogue song in the style of Scott Walker, late Scott Walker, making it very experimental and arid. Um, and what's his name? Adam Buxton, I think it is. Um, which you can Google yourself. But um, I think it's... Um, I had different, a different line to walk, you know, in the Johnny Cashian way. I, I was walking the line, I was always being told I had too middle class sounding a, a, a voice. It was too articulate and intelligent sounding and people didn't want rock music particularly to, to be that. They wanted it to be an angry proletarian energy. So the line I was walking, I then had to become something slightly dirty and, and outsiderish. So I became a pervert. That was my thing. Um, that was actually the, my way to offset having been, you know, rather expensively educated in a, a horribly perverse, actually, boarding school, which was the worst time of my whole life. But nevertheless, this was held against me. Not only was it misery at the time, but it was then held against me later in my music career. So I could be a, an unacceptable, unpalatable, nasty kind of pervert character, and that was my way to offset that. Scott had to offset having an angelic voice. Um, Leonard Cohen simply joked about, you know, I had no choice, I was born with the gift of a golden voice. Scott actually was born with the gift of golden voice, and that in a way was a limitation, but it was something he could play with. He could then go off into, um, just as I could go off into being obscene, offsetting my kind of nice, <coughs> privileged uh, sound, sounding voice with obscenity. Scott would offset it with um, alienation and strangeness and these, uh, these mysterious and really uh, impressive landscapes. So I, I, that's that's kind of what I think. I'm I'm obviously sad that that Scott has gone. Very very sad. Uh, never met him. Um, met Mark Armand, and um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I feel I'm part of an epigone generation. I I never really continued with the Brel thing. Obviously, I could have. I had a strange conversion that I was so into Brel, and then I suddenly was converted to Gansburg, and Gansburg was the anti Brel. That he was much more into sex and. Um, playfulness and beautiful melodies and um, a kind of provocative rebelliousness, but which was never, it never went into too scary places. You know, maybe Rock Around the Bunker gets a little bit scary in some ways. Um, there are murder scenarios and things and this, this um, the, you know, the, the incest scenarios and stuff, which is all quite disturbing, especially for us now in the moral climate that we live in now. But nevertheless, Gansburg is a bit like Cohen. There's this warmth at the bottom of, maybe it's a Jewish thing as well. There's a kind of Jewish warmth at the, in, in, deep in that music, which is, embraces you finally. I don't feel that Scott had that. He had a, a glacial kind of Nordic uh, coldness in his work, uh, which personally interests me less than the embracing warmth that I hear in Cohen and I hear in Gansburg. So, uh, and yet nevertheless we have to say he's one of the most intelligent artists who's ever made pop music, rock music, making people like Lou Reed, you know, with Lou Reed's later idea that, you know, a 60 minute CD could be like a novel or that, you know, guitar sounds or there's something inherently fantastic about an electric guitar sound if it's recorded in the right way. Lou got to be a bit of a bore in his old age, you know, fussing about details of guitar sounds and things like that. Whereas I think um, Scott Walker, you couldn't ever reproach him 
for getting boring. And I would say the same about um, Sylvian, actually. I think he's got more interesting as he's got older. And it's a little bit escaping his, um, his limitation, which is that, yeah, which is that he's, he's kind of a bit coffee table. <laughs> Sorry, David. I love your music. No, he's been actually a big influence on me as well. Probably more, I've been more influenced by Sylvian than by um, Scott Walker. Uh, simply because of it. it's the generational thing, and um, um, I'm interested in in a kind of effeteness and a delicacy, uh, which I don't think Scott had. He wasn't Scott wasn't effete. Um, this is what Brell uh, reproached Bowie for. Bowie wants to meet Brell uh, in the 70s, and Brell said, "Why would I meet that faggot?" So pédé, I think he used the word pédé about Bowie because he obviously just seen pictures of Bowie in a miniskirt, you know, with his big hair, thought. You know, for a man of Brel's generation, that was unmanly and uninteresting. And um, who knows if he would have uh, changed if he'd lived longer. Um, death is always sad. It's always sad. And um, I, I don't, I'm not one of these people who go, go around saying, rest in peace, rest in peace. Um, I think it's, that's, um, uh, but, I, but I did want to say something about Scott since I was asked. That's it. Open University.